Hey, welcome back to the Presidio Perspective. My name is Dustin Tenbrook, Certified Financial Planner and President of Presidio Capital Management. Good to be with you today here as we close the books on three quarters of the way of 2023 uh, at the end of the third quarter here. And man, it has been a year of surprises, mostly the resilience of the U.S. stock market, the U.S. consumer and the U.S. economy at, at, at large. Uh, but we just think the surprises are just getting started. So we're going to look through the data with you today, some of the stuff we're looking at on the Presidio Perspectives Recession Watch. We want you to be prepared for the changes and surprises ahead. So let's get it going. All right, so I have a lots of graphs and to share and charts to share that I've custom built for this episode of the Presidio Perspective. So those of you following along online on YouTube, uh, take note and I'll do my best for those listeners out there with me and your earbuds uh, listening to this podcast. Uh, but the big question on everybody's mind is, will the U.S. go into a recession? What will that recession look like? How severe? Um, yeah, maybe not will we, but when will we and how severe will that recession be? So uh, lots of people asking us this question and we know it's out there. So let's look at the data and let the data tell us generally what's next. As I said before, 2023 has been a year full of surprises. We think the surprises are just starting and these surprises in the future might not be the best ones. So let's get ready and prepare our portfolios. So history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes as we always say. So let's look back at the last three recessions. And we're tracking the two things that everybody's talking about here in this chart is the federal funds rate and the consumer price index. Okay, and so when we look back from 1999 until today, we've had three major recessions over that time. And we can look at what the Fed does, what consumer price index does right before, during, and after a recession so that we can help understand what's going on today and what might be ushered in in the months and years to come. When I look at the late 90s, we all recall most of us recall that this was a booming time for the economy. You had the advent of this new technology, the internet boom was happening. Company valuations were growing, the stock market was roaring, the NASDAQ large cap growth was taking off, and mostly just in a couple names okay, that dominated the index. Um, so not too unlike what we've seen in, in recent years. But with the inflation starting to climb, bubbles starting to pop up in the U.S. stock market, the Fed started to aggressively increase interest rates over that time, which was restrictive to the U.S. economy. Then they paused. A couple months later, they started to cut. Why did they cut? Because the data said something really bad is about to happen. And just a couple months after they started cutting, we ushered into a recession. And this is very typical. If we were to expand this chart, we would see that happens over and over and over. Okay, as we go into recession, what happens to that orange line in consumer price index is it starts going down. Inflation starts moderating. In fact, deflation starts to become a problem. So the asset prices have fallen. Stocks are worth less. Real estate is worth less. Okay, and what, what's happening is the Fed now wants to stimulate the economy. They start dropping interest rates becoming less restrictive. Once that purple line goes against the goes below the rate of inflation monitored by that orange consumer price index. So when the federal funds rate is below the inflation rate, that is an accommodative Fed. That is when economies typically grow. That's where we usher into a recovery phase. And generally, once the Fed has reached the bottom of their rate cutting cycle is when the stock market also reaches its bottom. Real estate values, asset prices have reached their bottom and they now start to recover. So this is a very common theme. Again, what happens in the mid 2000s, you start having inflation, you start having bubbles crop up in real estate across the country, and the Fed starts increasing interest rates. Okay, inflation's moderates, the Fed pauses. And by the way, this pause in before 2008. So this is a pause in 2007. It was the longest that the Fed has ever paused. 
okay, and the rate hiking cycle, and it lasted just seven months. So let's take note of that the next time the Fed says we're going to pause, because the longest ever on history before a recession happened was seven months. So here we go, or before they started cutting rates, preparing for the recession. Why did they cut rates? Because something in the data said something ba really bad is about to happen. And typically it does. So here, after the seven-month pause, we go into a very deep recession. Asset prices fall. Consumer price index falls. And the Fed drops interest rates. You can see that they dropped it here in the middle of the recession thinking they were done. You see there's a little pause there in their drop in the middle of the 2008-2009 financial crisis. They paused. And then what happened? In August 2008, Lehman Brothers went out of business and they said, oh no, we got it wrong again and we're going to cut more. And it took a long way to dig ourselves out of that deep, deep, deep recession, but we did. And then all of a sudden we started getting hot, inflation starts uh, growing, and what happens is the Fed increases interest rates again, being restrictive just for a moment here before we ushered in the COVID era, having a, having a quick but deep re um drop in the stock market, the largest unemployment number on record, but massive stimulus and spending, the Fed quickly cutting interest rates, boom, the economy again. And of course, what did the Fed say over this time? That inflation is transitory. No real issue with inflation. Everybody was just indoors because of COVID restrictions. They're going to get outside. They're going to go buy stuff. They're going to go to the movies. They're going to buy some airplane tickets, and it's going to all go back to normal. Well, they miscalculated the $6.6 .6 trillion of money printing and spending that the government created during that time and how much additional cash they just pumped into the system and how willing Americans were to spend it, um, which they have. And now it's just getting charged. But we'll get to that in a second. So that Fed, the same Fed we keep talking about, was wrong. And they said, oops, we were wrong. It's not transitory. And here in February of 2022, they said, we need to increase interest rates. And then they started embarking on a massive increase interest rate cycle, one of the fastest of in history. And here we are today. In May of 23, you see this orange line and this purple line cross. And this is the first time since pre-COVID that the Fed has actually been restrictive. So even though they're increasing interest rates, it has not been restrictive since May of 23. And just go back and look at your statements and look at the portfolio and see where all the growth of this year happened. And you'll see a correlation of when it stopped right around that June time. And if you look at the NASDAQ, you look at the S&P, you look at those growth companies, as long as the Fed was accommodative, meaning increasing interest rates, yes, but still below inflation. And you're going to see, oh, it's been pretty flat ever since uh, and down in some areas. So we take note. Because now we have a restrictive Fed, and it's only been four or five months of a really restrictive Fed. And inflation, core, CPI, which, of course, doesn't include food and energy, because who spends money on that, right? Uh, I, as an anecdotal story, just spent $7 at a pump in Carlsbad. So um, that's, that's something. Uh, but the prices are still way too high. We all know it. The Fed knows it. And here's the data. We're at 4.4 inflation, and we're supposed to get to 2. Well, we got more rate hiking to go, and this is going to get more restrictive. What does that mean? Asset prices are going to be challenged, meaning typically asset prices go down. Now, asset prices, the value of your real estate, the value of your stocks, oof, those are probably going to go down if the Fed stays restrictive. Again, just looking at history. Now, what do a lot of soft landers talk about is Oh, the U.S. consumer and the job market and the labor market is very strong. So I'm just going to show you what happens in recessions. And I just picked the last one because we really remember that uh, in the Great Recession, 2008 to 2010. And so what happens is let's track the U.S. spending tracked by retail sales and U.S. total revolving credit card debt. And what we see is the... U.S. retail sales is climbing here. This is 2005 to 2010. The retail sales is in orange here, and it just grows, 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 grows. And over that time, the Fed is becoming restrictive starting in 2007. So what happens? Oh, we just, you know, go ahead and charge it. And so those revolving credit card debt starts 
climbing, 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 reaching their peak as we go into a recession. What happens to retail sales? They level off, but don't decline. So very similar to what we're seeing today. And what this tells us is the U.S. consumer spends its way into the recession. You'll notice that the credit card balances kept charging. They kept going. U.S. retail sales in about halfway through the recession is when U.S. consumers said, uh-oh, I don't have any more money and I don't have a job. And that is typically when the spending stops. It's not that U.S. households are out there forecasting the economy over the next 3, 6, 9, 12 months. They will spend until they have, don't have a job, don't have, a, don't have money, don't have savings. And that's typically what happens. So even once you're in the recession, you can count on the U.S. consumer still spending for the next three, six, nine months until you see that unemployment number. And look at this big drop in revolving credit card debt. That's not because the U.S. consumer went about and found a bunch of money all of a sudden. Those are charge-offs. Those are bankruptcies. Those are write-downs of the revolving debt that just goes away that was never paid. And as we go through this deleveraging event, you kind of hit the bottom. And okay, that's when the stock market typically hits the bottom. The consumer comes back, you know, and they're able to start buying again now that they have debt at reasonable levels. And the Fed, of course, have cut the interest rate on that debt. So this is just kind of what happens. So now if we take that same data that I was just discussing about revolving consumer credit card debt and U.S. retail sales and later on the federal funds rate, you know, again, as we as the federal funds is raising their interest rate targeted in blue here, you can see consumer spending continues, revolving credit card continues, and then the Fed starts cutting rates. Why? Something really bad in the data. Something really bad in the data is about to happen, and the Fed starts getting ahead of it. Does the retail consumer, U.S. consumer, really take notice? Not too much, maybe a little, but it's not here until there was a big event that you saw the big break where the Fed really dropped into straights, and that's when you can see the correlation with retail sales. That's when you can see the revolving credit card debt come down, and that's typically showing you the bottom of the U.S. stock market. All this stuff before is the leading indicator going into a recession. Okay, and we still have more work to go. All right, I mean, inflation's still high, um, and it's just only been restrictive for just some period of time. So when I compile all of this data, and there's a lot more to look at, I just don't want to put too many slides out in front of you today. Um, but on our recession watch, we know that the Fed has just become restrictive over the last four or five months. Since that time, we've seen asset prices challenge. Real estate values have come down. Locally, you might have noticed. Uh, they certainly stopped going up. But what you thought you were going to sell your house for uh, six months ago, you're likely looking at something less. And I would argue not, not going out too much on a limb to say in six months from now, maybe lower. So we'll keep tracking that here on our recession watch. But on a restrictive Fed, 7% seven more, mortgage interest rates, real estate's challenged. The U.S. stock market, go back and look. Starting June, started to be challenged. Okay, right when the Fed became restrictive, really. Not just when they were raising interest rates, but when that rate became higher than the rate of inflation. So I know many of you are saying, great, thanks, Dustin. So glad I tuned in. Now I'm all worried about recession. Asset prices are falling. What to do? So look, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, right? And you know that and it's important to be diversified. No one has a crystal ball, but you need different things in your portfolio that are gonna work in different market cycles and different environments. Your financial plan should always dictate your asset classes, time horizons, risk tolerance, so that you have the right assets for your plan to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Okay, I'm gonna be doing a financial planning series that's gonna talk about that, but I think it's really important that we stay focused there and not just on the investments. The investments are an important part of financial planning. Okay, but that's just one part. Making sure that you have the right assets for your plan will allow you to accomplish the things that you want to do in life regardless of what the interest rates are from the Fed, what inflation rates are published with CPI, or what the stock market's doing for any 9, 18, or 36-month period. Okay, Your financial plan should accomplish all that and allow you to do the things that you want to do in life. But that's not so fun to talk about on a podcast. So let's just go ahead and talk about all the cool stuff about what the Fed, Fed's doing with interest rates and all that, right? But also, how can I make money in a recession? Okay, so what does well in a recession? We'll go ahead and Google it. What's the best asset class to own in a recession? It's government bonds, fixed income. 
Okay, so US fixed income and some recessions, world fixed income, but intermediate fixed income, long-term fixed income, these are US treasuries, okay? So loans, which today, if you look at the 10 year, it's over four and a half percent that you're getting paid guaranteed by the government and they'll guarantee to pay you all your money back. And so these are the things that do well in recessions. On average, do very well, nine or 10% on average of the last five recessions compiled. Okay, whenever when the stock market's losing on average more than 20%, they're making that money on an annualized basis. Um, so let's kind of look at some of the charts and data here so that we can take a look at what happens with fixed income uh, during the recession. So where do I want to start? Let's take you back to, oh, 2005 to, um, to June of 2007. Okay. So here we go. So this is, uh, on the top line, what the fed's doing with interest rates shown in orange. Okay. On the bottom line, we're looking at the, uh, Bloomberg U S treasury. Okay. So this is a, a basket of U S treasuries and it's showing you that during the time when Fed's hiking, look at the performance of, of U.S. fixed income, U.S. US government bonds, they do nothing, okay? So from, from 2005 to halfway through 2006, when the Fed is increasing interest rates, fixed income just barely plods along, doesn't do much. As the Fed pauses, it starts to perform. Why? Well, the Fed has increased interest rates, which means bonds now pay more interest. So as you hold those bonds through a rate hiking cycle, even when the Fed pauses, you start to earn all that interest. And so on a total return basis, you start to accumulate, you know, a decent so or so return over the next few months. Okay, so this is what happens during a rising rate environment where generally U.S. Treasuries and fixed income are going to go down or stay flat during the pause period. They're going to start to modestly uh, increase. But when we expand that out, and we look at that same 2005, but now go through 2009. What happens is right when that Fed pauses, you start to see that fixed income perform. And then look what happens when the Fed starts to cut. U.S. Treasuries, fixed income really takes off. So during this three-year period, you see the fixed income average over or earn over 30% or average about 10 10% per year. And this is in a time when the stock market crashes, real estate markets crashing. So this is a nice balance to have in your portfolio. This is just the data. This is what happens. Why? Because interest rates and the price of bonds have an inverse or opposite relationship. As interest rates are increasing, like they did in 2022, you see bond values drop in price. As interest rates decrease, like what the Fed does during a recession, you see bond values go up in price. People want to sell their stocks. They want to sell their real estate. They want to go into safe assets that are earning interest and have a guarantee to pay them back. So this is generally what happens. Same thing happened in COVID. But you can also say, look back in the 2000, 2003 era. If I look back to July of 2000, the Fed paused, you know, this is a 30 month period as the fed started to decrease interest rates from january 2001 through 2002 you see again what did fixed income do average 30 or earn 30 percent okay so this is at a time when the stock market was declining 20 to 30 percent a year doing horribly i think average 22 percent negative during this same period you had stocks uh you had the bond portion of your portfolio helping you out so do, can we predict when it's coming, the day it happens? No. Can we look at the data and make some inferences of some of the stuff that we should expect happens in our portfolio? Absolutely. So just want to take some time out. There's been a lot of questions about this recession watch. We're going to continue looking at more data with you today, looking at CPI, looking at the federal funds rate, retail sales, and consumer credit. So we'll look more in future podcasts at the local real estate market um, and the U.S. stock market uh, and global stock market as well as recession watch happens across the world. So thank you for tuning in this week on the Presidio Perspective. I look forward to being back with you here soon. Take care.